it seems like you know when we talk about genius, there is a sort of the that that creative capacity that we all have to some degree. But then there is the question of degree. So, yeah. I mean, do do you think neuroscience is giving us some answers as to why some people have it and some people don't? Well, I think neuroscience and genetics as well. So so recently there's been studies looking at like musical talent, and it shows that there's actually a really large genetic component involved. And so I think when we see these people who are at the way, you know, top ends of, you know, like three standard deviations out from the norm, mm -hmm. you're looking at a combination between somebody who's born with a particular predisposition to have a talent plus the practice. So for you, maybe, you know, you can practice from now until tomorrow and you'll only get to be so good as a concert pianist. But if you were doing that plus you had a genetic predisposition, you might get to these really far extremes and people might call you genius. But it's 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 a combination of the two. I, I once went around um, the world and met these people called superhumans who were like extraordinary in a particular domain. Like what? Like, for example, a person with an extraordinary memory. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, who can withstand an enormous amount of pain. And there are all sorts of these things that are way outside the norm. A man mm -hmm. who could hold his breath underwater for 22 minutes, mm -hmm. which is actually amazing. Yeah. And when you look at it, and we did experiments on them, it's, it's a combination of having a different physiology. Um, like, so for instance, the man who could hold his breath underwater had a larger lung capacity, but then he practiced and learned meditation, learned how to slow his body's metabolism and did all these other things that led him to hit this extreme. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with cognitive capacity. So even IQ, right, it's, it's, it's a measure of different cognitive aspects, you know, reasoning and mm -hmm. verbal um, abilities. But with practice, you can get to be the best within your biological constraints. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you, you hear about genius being associated with some of these disorders like schizophrenia, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, these, these things. I mean, do you think that they're interrelated or do you think at the very least we could learn something about genius from looking at people who, who are dealing with these disorders? So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of controversy, uh, controversy in this area because it's not necessary to have some sort of, you know, psychopathology in order to be a genius. And a lot of people conflate these two ideas, like the mad genius. And it happens that, yeah, there are a lot of people who are very talented who also happen to have a mental disorder. A lot of the mental disorders are initially things that are adaptive. Like even OCD, you know, it's good to sort of have structure and have certain rituals, but when it gets to be extreme, then it becomes problematic. So mm -hmm. these are things that we all have that are adaptive that sometimes go a little too far extreme, it doesn't necessarily mean that that correlates with creativity. However, if you do think about it, something like OCD, where you're really, um, a certain type of OCD, where you're really paying attention to the detail, might allow you to put in the hours to, you know, for example, like Darwin, to obsessively mm -hmm. collect all of these things. Um, but that in itself is not enough. He also, I think, needed the divergent thinking, the creative thinking to put all the pieces together. So although there might be some sort of advantages with some of these disorders in the sense that it might make you be more focused on a particular task, mm -hmm. I think it's not enough. There's still something else there. And so in a sense, these people might be geniuses despite their disorders. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, because I would think that, um, you know, there would, when you talk about divergent thinking and making these novel associations, you know, as you say, like, um, you can make an infinite number of random associations. And so that line there between what's uh, a brilliant insight of a genius and what's something that's a, a, a dream or a delusion um, yeah. might be kind of hard to draw the line there. Well, if you think of someone like, let's say, um, John Nash, right, who they did this whole... So John Nash, uh, beautiful, beautiful mind. He was a mathematician, mathematician at Princeton, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. And what was interesting is that it, it so it appears that when he wasn't taking his medication and which allowed his schizophrenic uh, symptoms to sort of you know uh, crank up, he wasn't able to do his creative math at that oh. point, right? It became mm. too detrimental. Mm -hmm. So there might be there is a point in which you know too much outside of the box thinking it leads to, to, to non-creative ideas just random associations novel mm -hmm. associations delusions so 
when he had his medication and it pulled back his symptoms, that's when he was able to be sort of, you know, work that was sort of genius, right? Mm -hmm. But I think, again, it was in spite of his disorder, not because of it. Mm -hmm. That being said, people who have certain types of mental illness have different wiring in their brain. And part of that having a different kind of wiring, so to speak, could in some sense be related to having a different way of thinking, which could produce these genius type thoughts. Can you like, you know, if you pick out one outlier, like one Einstein, is there that much that you can learn just from studying them? I mean, is it possible to unlock an individual's genius? So, I mean, people have looked at Einstein's brain. I actually got to see it when it was on display um, at the Wellcome Trust in London, which mm. was really cool. Um, Did it look amazing? It was like parts of his brain, actually. No, it didn't said, look amazing. God, look at that the sulcus there. No, he, yeah, he had he had variation in his, in like, I think it was the um, Sylvian fissure. And there was a couple of things that were different. But you, re as far as I'm concerned, I don't think you can learn that much just by looking. Because at an individual brain, we all have little quirks and you know, no two brains are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So I think it really has more to do with um, the way, not just anatomy, but it's, it's function and that has to do with the way it's wired. Mm -hmm. And unless we could really see his brain in action, you know, you're only gonna get a small little piece of the puzzle if you're just looking at you know, anatomical structure. Mm -hmm. And for example, if, if we take two people who have exactly the same sort of lesion, um, or area of damage in the brain, and then we do cognitive tests on them. You know, one person might have a very severe deficit in, in a certain area of thinking, and another person might not, with the same exact lesion. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of differences, and you can't just look at one brain and understand the whole picture.